Flick tests are an important tool in the toolbox of the hydrogeologist. They're relatively easy to conduct, and they can give reasonable values of the transmissivity of an aquifer. So in order to conduct the slug tests, we'll change the drawdown or the head in the well suddenly, and we measure how the well responds to that change in head. So here's a schematic of what's going to happen. This is the well here, and the well is intersecting a permeable layer. This is a thin fracture, so this represents um, perhaps a, a permeable fracture in the lower well field. Up here, this thing is a slug, and in order to conduct the test, uh, we'll drop this in the well. The slug is a cylinder that is heavier than water. There's a rope to it, so when we drop it in the well, it sinks and it displaces an amount of water that's equal to its volume. So the first step is to drop the slug in the well. That raises the water level up by an amount that's equal to the volume of the slug. The next step is, so actually what's happened here is that in the formation, the, um, the head was equal to the initial head. So this is the initial head right here. And when we introduce that slug, the head rises. And so now the head is up here in the well, but it's still here in the aquifer. And so there's a big difference in head, and that causes the water to flow from the well into the aquifer. And initially, because there's a big head difference, the flow is quite large. And so the water level drops as a result of this flow going out like that. And then it continues to drop. As the head drops, though, it approaches the head in the aquifer. And so the rate at which it drops decreases because the gradient is getting smaller, the head gradient. OK, so it, it continues to drop. And eventually, it drops and approaches the initial head. Uh, once you reach static conditions, then uh, there are no longer any changes. So that's the slug in because we've put the, this cylinder into the well. And then we pull the cylinder out. This is the slug out. This causes the water level to drop. And then the water level and the, um, the water level in the well and the water level in the aquifer are out of equilibrium again. And so now water is going to flow from the formation into the well in order to fill the well back up and have it equilibrate with the uh, aquifer. So uh, this is what the water level is doing over here. It drops suddenly, and now it's rising back up. And it'll have the same kind of path where it, it, there's a big change initially, and then it changes gradually and rises up and gradually then approaches the initial head. So this is the slug out test. And it's similar to the slug in test, except it's a uh, it's, uh, head falling or head drop instead of a head rising. OK, so that's how we do the test. And in order to analyze it, we want to go and uh, work up a, a simple analysis that will allow us to estimate the hydraulic conductivity and transmissivity. And so to do that, we use this, this principle of a water balance that we've applied before in the class and we'll use again. And the strategy is to draw the control volume that we use to conduct this water balance around the well. And in this case, the control volume will be right around the edge of the well. And it'll go up into the headspace of the well, as I'm, as I'm showing right there. So that's the, um, that's the control volume. And we can have water flowing out of this control volume. Uh, that'll be, that'll be the, the, the water that flows from the well into the formation. And if we say that the, that time 0 is, um, is right when the head rises as a result of slug in, there will be no flow going in. And the water that's stored in here is equal to this this water here. So those will be the main components of the balance. And we can write the balance like this, that the volumetric flow rate into the control volume equals the volumetric flow rate out plus 
the rate at which the volume that's stored in the control volume, the rate at which that volume changes. So that's the that's going to be the basic um, water balance formula that we'll use always, and it'll apply here for the slug test. And so, for this particular scenario, the volumetric flow rate is is zero. Um, we're going to start this analysis after the slug is already in, so there's no water flowing into this dashed red zone. The water that flows out, we can write like this. And what I'm what I'm thinking here is that uh, you have something like this. So here's the head, and this is this is age zero. And when the water level rises it'll be equal to h right there so it'll rise up and that's h and so uh, the water level or the water profile looks something like that that'll be the head in the aquifer so we see that there's a slope that's the head gradient and if we go out here some distance delta r then the head gradient is going to be this difference here well i guess that that H, H is really is really going to be like this. We have a datum. This is the initial head, and this is the head that's in the well. So when I write this thing here, this difference, that's intended to just give us this difference here. This H minus H zero. That's the amount that the head has changed in the well as a result of doing the test. Okay, so this thing right here gives us the hydraulic head gradient in the radial direction, and that's what's driving the flow away from the well. And if we multiply that by the hydraulic conductivity and by the surface area through which the flow is going, then that's the flow that's going out of the well and into the formation. Okay, so the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to say that H0, that's just the initial head, I'm going to say that's equal to zero. And the way that I do that is it's, it's a fairly simple argument. You just say that um, my datum for, for the heads is going to be right here. So that's, that's H0. So that's equal to zero. And then H, the head in the well, rises with respect to that. So if we say H0 equals zero, and then if we lump together this term A and uh, the delta R, A is the surface area of the well, and delta R is that radial distance that we use to get the gradient. I lump those things together and just call them this thing here, a geometry factor. It will, th this thing will depend on what the well looks like. What, where the screen is, that kind of thing. And so there'll be some various different ways that we'll do this. Right now, let's just, for simplicity, lump this together and call it the geometry factor. And so if we do that, then we get this, that the flow rate out of the well is equal to, that's H, that's the head in the well, times K of the formation, times this geometry factor. Okay, well that kind of makes sense because what it's saying is that the flow rate out of the well, it's going to be greatest when H in the well is greatest. And then as H falls, the flow rate out will fall. And the, the magnitude will depend on K. If, if it's more permeable, it'll, it'll flow out faster. And there also is this geometric effect. Okay, so I think that makes sense. So we have this term here, that's just zero, and this term here is this. And now we have to do the change in the volume stored with time. So the way to do that is to first determine what the volume of water stored in the well is. So that's going to be um, the, the radius or the, the area of the, this um, casing. So it's the cross-sectional area of the casing. So that's pi rw squared. And then times h. So if it's like this, if there's the head in the well, that's h. Then the
the volume that we're interested in is that volume right there. And this is kind of an important point because what we're doing here is writing as the volume stored in the well, this volume here, and that's, it's not the total volume that's stored, but that's the total volume that's stored that could be removed. We're not really going to be removing this volume, um, so we don't really care about including that. But this hatched volume could be removed, or it, it, it's the, the volume that's going to be, it's the stored volume that's, that's, that could potentially um, be exchanged. So that's the volume right there. And then in order to get this term, we have to see how that volume changes with time. So we just take the derivative of both sides, and we get the rate of change of the volume with time. And that's going to be equal to this. And all we do is say that, well, pi and rw, those are both constant. So if you take the time derivative of them, you don't get anything. But if you take the time derivative of this whole, these, the product of these three, you just get the rate of change of uh, the head with time. So that the head's changing. So if you apply the the derivative with respect to time to, to this product, you just get these two guys out front because they're constant times the rate of change of the head with time. Okay, so now we have this term here, and now we can substitute. So this goes in there, this goes in there, and this goes in there. Okay, so that's the result of the substitution. And then you just solve for this thing. Okay, so here's what it says. The rate of change of the head in the well with time is equal to this stuff here, which is, all that's a constant. K, G, pi, R, W squared, all that stuff's a constant. And then H, that's the head in the well. So the, this is the rate at which the head changes. It's a negative. There's a negative sign there. So this means that the greater the head, the more rapidly the head will, will be falling. So I think that that makes sense, because right at the beginning of the test, we said that the, there was a big head gradient. And so the, right at the beginning of the test, when the head was highest, we expected that the rate of fall of the head would be the greatest. And that's what's really being stated here. OK, so um, then the next step is to solve this. And this is a little um, first order differential equation. And so we can solve it and get this. And that's just from integrating this equation. And then we get a constant of integration. And we can solve for that constant by saying that h has to equal h0 at t equals 0. And so if we use that initial condition, here is the result. OK, and this is, this will be the equation for the, this is describing the, um, how the heads change as a function of time during a slug test. So there's the result that we just got from the previous page. And what this is going to do, what, let's see, one way to plot this, if we take, if we raise both sides to the exponential, then we get this, h over h0 equals e to the minus k g pi r w squared t. Okay, so that's negative exponential, and it looks like that, where this would be h over h0, starting at 1, and going as a function of time. So it drops fast at first, and then kind of flattens out. So what this guy Vorslev did was he recognized that it was this kind of a function, and if we if we say that, let me, let me go and let me erase that, just to make it a little bit clearer. So 
So this is h over the initial head. And so at time equals 0, h over h0 will be equal to 1. And then it drops off like that as a function of time. OK, so what Vorslev said is that, well, if this, if this is 0 0.5 and this is 0 0.37, OK, so at this point here, the head has dropped to 37% of the initial head. And so if I take that h over h0 equals 0 0.37, and if I, if I take that and I substitute it in there, well, if you check this out on your calculator, if you do the natural log of 0 0.37, what you'll find is that that's equal to minus 1. So you go over here at, the, at, at 0.37, and you hit this line and go down there, and that's a particular time. OK? That's a particular time. And we'll call that the time when this head ratio is equal to 0.37. OK, so if I substitute in h over h0 of 0.37 in here, that occurs at a particular time. And that's the 0 0.37 time. So what I've done is to just put that right there. OK, so. What Vorslev did was recognize that if you take a, a head value at a particular time, at this 0.37, when the head equals 0.37 of the initial head, and you determine when that occurs, then you get this equation. OK, and the important thing is that we know everything here except k. And so we can solve for k. And when we do that, we get, we get this. And what this says is that k is equal to, this is the area of the casing. This is the geometric factor. And that is that particular time. So, I mean, this is easy to, to know. This is just from the well. And this is pretty easy to measure, the 0.37. If we just plot the data up, if we have data like this and we plot h over h0, there's 1. And we have, we have some data from the field. Looks like that. We fit a line to it. We go out here to 0.37. And we go down here to, to the time. And then we can get that time from the field data. OK, so fourth lev is really pretty straightforward to use. And we get the information that we need to calculate what the hydraulic conductivity is. OK, so Vorslev worked out geometric factors for several different scenarios. And the one that is used the most is this guy here. Um, this is the geometric factor for uh, a fully penetrating well in a confined aquifer. So it's a scenario that looks like this. Here's the, here's the aquifer. And let me, let me erase that. I kind of messed up the drawing. So let's say here's, here's the aqu aquifer. And the well fully penetrates through that aquifer. And here's the screen. And so um, the well's infinite extent and the well fully penetrates through it. So it's much like the same geometric scenario as is assumed for the Tice and Jacob solutions. And if that's the case, then the geometric factor is given here, where this is uh, Le, the thickness of the, uh, the length of the casing and the thickness of the aquifer. And that R, that's the radial distance of, or the radius of the well bore. Now, if it's a, if it, in some wells, the radius of the casing right there and the radius of the well are the same. But in, in, in a lot of wells, including some of our wells, the well looks like this. There's a screen in the well, and then there's
there's a seal right here in a gravel pack. And so typically what's done is to say that this gravel pack, that's the, well, from there out is R. And this is, the radius here is RW. Is, is RW. Okay, so you have these different um, radii depending on um, whether you're, on what part of the well you're in. Okay, so the Vorslev analysis gives us the most basic kind of analysis for slug tests. There are some others that are included on a worksheet that we've developed for you. One is called the defrax analysis, and this is for use in fractured rock. And uh, what we did was to do some numerical analysis for this geometric factor for several different scenarios in fractured rock, and we found that the geometric factor ranges from 0.8 to 1.4 for different scenarios. And so well, what seems to be feasible to do is, as an initial estimate, just use the geometric factor uh, of 1.0 as an initial estimate. And so that, that makes this really the easiest of the, uh, the different methods for slug test analysis. A more complicated analysis, but one that gives a good bit of versatility, is the, is the analysis by Bauer and Rice. And their analysis assumes that we have a well whose screen is what's called partially penetrating an aquifer. So if the aquifer is shown here as B, so it's all in here, and the, the well is partially penetrating that, um, then the, the location of the, the well in the screen, or the location of the screen in the aquifer, uh, will play a role in the performance of the aquifer test. And so the Bauer and Rice analysis has uh, as variables the um, saturated thickness of the aquifer, the distance from the water table down to the bottom of the screen, and the length of the screen. So um, in Vorslev, there's just one parameter that describes the geometry. Uh, in this case, well, one parameter and the, the, the term R, and then in Bauer and Rice, the, instead of having this one, they, we have two additional ones. And so as a result of that, the Bauer and Rice analysis is a bit more complicated than the Vorslev. But it's fairly straightforward to implement, and I'll show you how in just a second.